So you had a, you specified a 12, 12 eating window, uh, which is kind of intermittent fasting. Uh, so a couple of questions on that. So why 12, 12? I mean, would 18, 6, 8, 16 have been better? And, but you think maybe people wouldn't stick to it. And you also said 7 p.m. to 7 a.m. So is there something magic about those numbers? Would 10 p.m. to 10 a.m. also work? I think um, there's some suggestion that intermittent fasting windows, um, you know, outside of normal sort of diurnal, you know, light, dark cycles are less effective. Mm. However, if you've got a shift worker or, you know, if you've got somebody whose clock is different, you have to respect that. You know, you really have to respect that. But when you're designing a clinic trial, you need to, you know, you, you, you have to define your, your window pretty strongly. When you add in time variable, it's just another piece of data that would require analysis. And it's, I mean, and we, our study is extraordinarily complex. So we had to um, attempt to kind of limit that complexity. Right. And so we, we had to make some decision points. Right. Okay. Yeah. No, I understand that. That makes sense. Yeah. I mean, uh, you could, I mean, Avi, oh, and then the other piece. Yeah. So if we did more strict, I mean, you know, of course, Longo thinks, you know, 12, 12 mm. and 12 is, is ideal. I mean, it depends on whose literature you look at. If we had done stricter intervals, um, we, I, I might've wanted to I might explore that as a more standalone kind of an intervention to see its influence. Mm. Um, I think perhaps, perhaps the structure that we used allowed us to kind of highlight the influence of the diet. I don't, you know, I don't know, you know, everybody's right. uh, rightly so people are asking, well, which, which aspect mm. about your intervention is, has done the heavy lifting, but um, mm. we, and the, you know, and finally, it was a challenging study to recruit for. Now, if I had gone into the, you know, the longevity world and, you know, advertised it perhaps or recruited through you, we might have found a lot of people, but we wanted to isolate our population to Portland, Oregon. We didn't want, you know, where the institute is. Um, we wanted healthy middle-aged men, and we can talk about why, although I think your listeners probably know uh, why. And um, recruiting a group um, large enough who are willing to adhere to a pretty rigorous and different diet, um, engage in, in uh, the other interventions that we were, that we required, you know, not on medication, you know, not with pre-existing conditions that would exclude them. I mean, it, you know, to, it, we, we had to actually make a rolling enrollment. It was uh, challenging for us to get our numbers. Right. Yes. And, and I'm assuming I hadn't thought about the complexity and, and why. Yeah, I mean, in the end, it, you've got to draw some yes. boxes and say, okay, this, yes, this is do. what you're going to, yeah. This, it was a, it's a great experience. So as a clinician, we've got a lot more flexibility. I mean, we individualize the, the methylation diet and lifestyle program all of the time for the human being sitting in front of us. And I absolutely think that that's doable. I'm actually writing a book now, which is a combination of discussing the study and my thoughts around DNA methylation in general, um, and how we've used it in clinic, you know, and how one can layer it into a more aggressive intermittent fasting. One can layer it into, you know, we treat people with small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. One can layer it into a fo low FODMAP protocol. Like you can, you can really use this tool. It's, it's malleable, which for me is, is very exciting. One other point I want to make though, too, is that, you know, the, my co-PI, Ryan Bradley at the Health Gut Institute um, at NUNM, um, thought that adherence was going to be a real sticking point for us. He thought that that was going to be challenging for us to have good participant adherence. Mm. And, and, and when you, if you've re read the literature, nutrition literature, it's like notoriously mm. kind of ridiculous, right? When dietary recall over the course of a year or something like, I mean, it's like our, our, our nutri it's, it's challenging to have good quality adherence you know, um, you've certainly heard or read the, the Horvath paper where they looked at um, generally healthy diet on, um, you know, the, the DNA methylation clock. Um, I think it was the intrinsic and extrinsic, so the Horvath and Hanum. Um, and 
he the, the way that they were able to see that a generally healthy diet made a little bit of a difference was by measuring beta carotene. When they relied on dietary recall, they didn't see favorable changes. So they actually had to see a, a, a biomarker that yes, in fact, people are eating more vegetables, right? So, so, yeah. so adherence in nutrition programs, especially of our complexity is challenging. And so to that end, we had our participants connect with a nutritionist from our program trained in the program. Um, and they were required to meet with them at least weekly during the first month. And then they were able to be in contact with them um, more than that after. And I wanna say that our nutritionists were not cheerleaders. They weren't able to rah, rah and tell them how good they're doing and you know tell them, yes, this will make you feel better and blah, blah, blah. They had to follow an IRB approved, very dry script do you have any questions, <laughs> you know, just move through it. And, and it was, again, it, us coming from a clinical world that was different for us, but I think our nutritionist involvement made the difference between successful adherence to our program and not. And Ryan Bradley, um, going back to him, he, he said <laughs> he was, he was sort of tracking us administering this program. He anticipated that we I think I think part of them anticipated we we wouldn't necessarily be successful. Okay, <laughs> because um, it's it's a huge issue, you know, with nutrition interventions. Yes, yeah, no, I can imagine that it, it's quite difficult. So, one thing you you kind of touched on it before, right? So we wanted you wanted more B twelve, you wanted more folate, you wanted basically methyl donors, but you said we you didn't want to do any. Uh, I guess supplementation. supplementation. Yeah. Could mm -hmm. you touch on that uh, mm -hmm. briefly? Yeah. yeah, yeah. So, so the the reason is that you know really fundamentally, as we age, we know DNA methylation goes awry, and it's not simply hypomethylation. It's not in one direction. Mm -hmm. It's imbalanced, and you actually see that the changes in the clock. Um, it's not, it's almost evenly divided between hyper and hypo, you know, the, the, the clock itself. So, so we need, if we don't want to just push it forward, there is sufficient suggestion in the literature, I think, that, you know, pushing uh, high dose, B, not even necessarily high dose, but B vitamin supplements in a certain population may push cancer forward. There is an interesting study, B proof, um, looking at um, fracture, addressing fractures, fracture risk using B12 and folate. And I can actually give you the citation. And um, the individuals oldest in the study mm -hmm. were at increased risk for colorectal cancer. There was, uh, and they, mm -hmm. and they actually challenged it. That study came under a lot of fire. And so they reanalyzed it and republished and the finding was, a, was consistent. And, you know, there's, there are a, enough studies of that kind to, for me to be, take pause in how I'm prescribing it. There's a U curve with our methyl donors. We absolutely need them. We need them lavishly. Um, in fact, if we're in, insufficient in methyl donors, you know, there's an increased risk in cancer and other diseases. So insufficiency is a problem and excess is probably also an issue. We, we have the opportunity in our country, um, in the US, and, and I, I'm not sure about, about Hong Kong, to see higher levels of circulating methyl donors because we have a fortification program here. And so people can, you know, really top up quite high. And I think you can see some associated imbalances so that's a big reason why we didn't want to use methyl donor supplements in our study. The other piece is that it would have been really hard to tease apart again. You know, it's kind of a, an aggressive intervention. And I think any, any findings probably would have been attributed um, to that. Right. I hope that you found the video informative. Please do hit the thumbs up button, subscribe to our channel, and hit the bell button for any new video release notifications. Thank you so much for your kind support. I wish you all well and we'll speak to you again soon.